So this will be our fourth video in Baha'i Cosmology. At the outset I want to state that this video is actually dependent on three previous videos. So if you've jumped in at this moment, there actually are three previous videos that lay out some groundwork upon which this presentation will be based. Um, as well, there is definitely a, a great degree of trepidation surrounding presenting this topic, because I really do believe it's profoundly and shockingly complex, rich, and beautiful. I do not in any way think this is an end product <laughs> of Baha'i cosmology, as I, like any other Baha'i presenter and any other student of the Baha'i faith, is merely offering their understandings of what the central figures of the Baha'i faith have said. I'm really hoping that this is a conversation starter, uh, a presentation of a model so that other can others can reflect their perspectives and their understandings off one vision so that a greater and more deeper, a richer picture can actually be, if you will, crafted or seen by the Baha'i community. Um, why I say trepidation is because I think that there's when we look at the different religions of the world, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism and Hinduism, and how there are different visions, if you will, of the realms above this one, the nature of uh, ultimate reality, if you will, of the sacred, this is where the vast, vast majority of misunderstandings and miscommunications occur. It is in this realm, which we have previously termed the realm of Jabirut, that a, a deep misunderstanding has actually been fostered, some simply because of our lack of patience and willingness to listen to the other and hear how they perceive it, and as well because, if you will, an accrual of certain doctrines and dogmas that have been attached, if you will, to the original revelation of the central figure of that faith, for example, the Buddha, or Krishna, or Jesus Christ. So the vast majority of misunderstandings arise here. And I'm going to do my best to try to present how I see this, and undeniably will fail in the process in being as articulate or as clear as I would hope. Uh, throughout this four video series, and there may be more to come on this topic, I have refrained for the most part from relating what the Baha'i texts are saying distinctly or precisely in any way to Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or Hinduism, or Buddhism for that matter. Uh, I'm doing this because I want us to try to see what the Baha'i writings say themselves as clearly as we can, with as many texts as we can, in the hopes that a map, a picture, a tapestry, or a vision will actually be created, that we can then use that, if you will, tapestry, that grand tapestry from the Baha'i writings, when we then actually begin to apply them to the perspectives of the New Testament, or the perspectives of the Quran, or of the Pali Canon, or of the Bhagavad Gita. So those kinds of applications of Baha'i thought, or a Baha'i's thought, to former revelations of the sacred in human history are to come after this series. To begin, we're going to start with a text from the Bab which I have termed the central orb, the primal will of God. If, however, thou art sailing upon the sea of creation, know thou that the first remembrance, which is the primal will of God, may be likened unto the sun. God hath created him through the potency of his might, and he hath, from the beginning that hath no beginning, caused him to be manifested in every dispensation through the compelling power of his behest, and God will, to the end that knoweth no end, continue to manifest him according to the good pleasure of his invincible purpose. And know thou that he indeed resembleth the sun. Were the risings of the sun to continue till the end that hath no end, yet there hath not been, nor ever will be, more than one sun. And were its settings to endure for evermore, still there hath not been, nor ever will be, more than one sun. It is this primal will which appeareth resplendent in every prophet, and speaketh forth in every revealed book. In the time of the first manifestation, the primal will appeared in Adam. In the day of Noah, it became known in Noah. In the day of Abraham, in him. And so in the day of Moses, the day of Jesus, the day of Muhammad, the apostle of God, 
the day of the point of the bayan, the day of him whom God shall make manifest, and the day of the one who will appear after him whom God shall make manifest. Hence the inner meaning of the words uttered by the apostle of God, I am all the prophets, inasmuch as what shineth resplendent in each one of them hath been and will ever remain the one and the same Son. So one aspect that sticks out very clearly that um, I have put forward in many other quotes in previous videos is that there is one singular primal will of God, uh, the first remembrance. And when the Baha'i writings are referencing the Son of Reality or the Son of Truth, it is this oneness, this singularity that is actually being referred to. This is the station of the oneness of the manifestations of God, that we see that there hath not ever been nor will there ever be more than one Son, and that this primal will appears resplendent in every single one of the prophets of God. And these are the major prophets, those who bring a book, the manifestations of God in Baha'i terminology. We have mentioned here Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, him whom God shall make manifest, and the one who will appear after him whom God shall make manifest. So it's very important to, at the beginning, because this has been what's presented in previous videos, to recognize that there is one primal will, one first remembrance, one word of God, that that singular entity is manifested or reflected as the term often used within the human temples of Jesus Christ, of the Buddha, of Krishna. We're going to see that there is a diversity and a multiplicity as well in the vehicles, as we would have to see, on the plane of history with Noah and Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad. Yet in the end, what is being communicated, what is being manifested, what is being transmitted is the light of that one singular Son, the Word of God, the primal will, the first remembrance. Now this being is not God itself. If we note from it that God actually if you will, sends out the first will, sends out the first remembrance. I want to jump very quickly to a quote. This is actually from Abdu'l Baha in London. And the question in this quote that begins it is, is the divine manifestation God? Abdu'l Baha's answer in this talk is this. Yes, and yet not in essence. A divine manifestation is as a mirror reflecting the light of the sun. The light is the same, and yet the mirror is not the sun. All the manifestations of God bring the same light. They only differ in degree, not in reality. The truth is one. The light is the same, though the lamps may be different. We must look at the light, not at the lamp. If we accept the light in one, we must accept the light in all. All agree, because all are the same. The teaching is ever the same. It is only the outward forms that change. The manifestations of God are as the heavenly bodies. All have their appointed place and time of ascension, but the light they give is the same. If one wishes to look for the sun rising, one does not look always at the same point because that point changes with the seasons. When one sees the sun rise further in the north, one recognizes it, though it has risen at a different point. It's a fascinating answer given by Abdu'l-Baha, because the question is, is the divine manifestation God? And the answer is yes, and yet not in essence. So you're seeing God through the teachings and the light shone through these sacred beings. That they are the lamps carrying that one light, which is the light of God, which we've seen in the previous passage from the Bab, that that is the primal will, the first remembrance, the will of God, the Logos, the Word. That we must see that, if you will, beyond the heavenly bodies, the term, is that these are the embodiments of the sacred within our world, and see that the light is the same even though the outward forms and outward semblances differ. What's interesting is that Abdu'l-Baha here says that they are God, yet not in essence. And this is the difference between what we'd call God in function, 
meaning, if you will, the communication of God, the words of God, the face of God. And I'm going to jump right away to a quote from Baha'u'llah on this point. The essence of belief in divine unity consisteth in regarding him who is the manifestation of God, and him who is the invisible, the inaccessible, the unknowable essence, as one and the same. By this is meant that whatever pertaineth to the former, all his acts and doings, whatever he ordaineth or forbiddeth, should be considered, in all their aspects and under all circumstances, and without any reservation, as identical with the will of God himself. This is the loftiest station to which a true believer in the unity of God can ever hope to attain. This is a very, very heavy passage. <laughs> The loftiest station to which a true believer in the unity of God can ever hope to attain. And what is that? To regard the manifestation of God and the invisible, the inaccessible, the unknowable essence as one and the same. That they are functionally the same because the manifestation of God is the heavenly body of the first remembrance, the primal will, through whom God always communicates. That that being the word of God, the primal will, is the singular one intermediary between God and men. Humankind receives the light of divinity through these beings, therefore they are God in function, though not in essence. They stand in as the very voice of God. And there are aspects of this that we can pull, if you will, from section 1 and section 2, that right now you are hearing me talk. <laughs> I am presenting my thoughts and my feelings and my sentiments surrounding this topic. Uh, what you see is not really what I am. This is the face of Rob. This is the body of Rob that you are presented with. The reality, the essence of what I am is far, far different. The extent of my hopes and my dreams and my thoughts and my knowledge and my understanding my own struggles and trials, all those things you're only getting, if you will, what I am sharing with you, the revelation of the essence of Rob, through the functional heavenly body of this video and this human temple. So the idea that when the manifestations of gods are communicating, in some sense it's like when I say to you, I would really like you to do this, or I really hope for this, or I'm aspiring to that. That's actually the Word of God. That's the manifestation of my hopes and dreams and desires. That this is what the manifestations of God are. That we are seeing the only way we ever could see God, which is through the manifestation of His attributes and qualities. In this case, in the person of the manifestation of God. Many misunderstandings have arisen on this one sole point. Many of the manifestations of God have been persecuted, exiled, and even killed because of the misunderstanding on this point. I want to read you a passage from Baha'u'llah's Epistle to the Son of the Wolf. This station is the station in which one dieth to himself and liveth in God. Divinity, whenever I mention it, indicateth my complete and absolute self-effacement. This is the station in which I have no control over mine own weal or woe, nor over my life, nor over my resurrection. Baha'u'llah says that when divinity is attributed, whenever he mentions it, he means that he is utterly and absolutely self-effaced. The images used very often in this are, if you will, the reed flute. It is the emptiness of the flute that enables the music of the actual player to come through. It is the perfectly polished mirror that enables the image of the sun to be seen in its perfection. It is in some sense the non-existence of the vessel which allows the true melody or the true image, the true light to shine through. In some sense, once again, this isn't shockingly bizarre. If I came up to you and I were to recite a sonnet of Shakespeare, and I had removed all of my own perspectives and my own, if you will, desires to ornament it, but I was actually reciting to you pure Shakespeare, I will have emptied myself and allowed Shakespeare to speak through myself. 
and this is in the realm of poetry and prose. Yet I could take, for example, the origin of the species, <laughs> Darwin's seminal work, and I could memorize it from cover to cover, and I could recite verbatim, word for word, what Charles Darwin wrote in On the Origin of the Species. And really, in a very true way, it would be an empty rob transmitting and communicating the thoughts of Charles Darwin, if I did it faithfully, if I was utterly self-effaced, if I myself were polished, and the perfection of his message came through me, be it Shakespeare or Darwin, you would be hearing Charles Darwin's thoughts. And in some sense, if you were to say, well, I don't agree with that, and I say, well, actually, uh, I'm, I'm Darwin. At this moment, I am Darwin. At this moment, I am Shakespeare. I am vocalizing, and, or playing, or uh, expressing the thoughts and sentiments of another being. So the concept of the Divine Manifestation, being, or spe being divine, or speaking with the Word of God, is in the perfection of the reflection, the utter self-effacement, and the emptiness of the vessel. Certain ones among you have said, He it is who hath laid claim to be God, by God. This is a gross calumny. I am but a servant of God, who hath believed in him and in his signs, and in his prophets, and in his angels. My tongue and my heart, and my inner and my outer being, testify that there is no God but him, that all others have been created by his behest, and been fashioned through the operation of his will. There is none other God but him, the Creator, the Raiser from the dead, the Quickener, the Slayer. I am he that telleth abroad the favors with which God hath, through his bounty, favored me." Many have taken the statements of Baha'u'llah without understanding this facet of, his, of the teachings of the Baha'i Faith. So certain ones say that he has laid claim to be God, and he says that this is a gross calumny, a libelous comment, for he is a servant of God. There is no other God. And it's interesting here, he says, all others have been created by his behest, and have been fashioned through the operation of his will. And we have seen uh, in previous videos that it is actually the will of God, the first remembrance, the primal will, his word, the Logos, that is actually the creator of all things, that all have been created through his will, and Baha'u'llah is including himself. There is this singularity that is being, the song of that singularity is being sung through the reed flute that is Baha'u'llah. And he says, I am he that telleth abroad the favors with which God through his bounty favored me. So God is even above the light embodied in Baha, because the essence of God, Hahut, as the term we were using, is completely ineffable. Whenever we actually attempt to describe it, we are describing Lahut, that singular primal will, that first remembrance, the first mind. And that that being itself is actually being reflected through these heavenly messengers. When speaking of the function of the manifestation of God, here is a quote from Baha'u'llah. Know thou of a certainty that the unseen can in no wise incarnate his essence and reveal it unto men. He is and hath ever been immensely exalted beyond all that can either be recounted or perceived. From his retreat of glory, his voice is ever proclaiming, Verily I am God. There is none other God besides me, the All-Knowing, the All-Wise. I have manifested myself unto men, and have sent down him who is the dayspring of the signs of my revelation. Through him I have caused all creation to testify that there is none other God except him, the incomparable, the all-informed, the all-wise. He who is everlastingly hidden from the eyes of men can never be known except through his manifestation." I think this passage from Gleanings is actually a perfect example of how often uh, 
um, misunderstandings can arise. It's stated first that the unseen cannot incarnate. That there's none other God besides me is what it says. But that I manifest myself unto men through the day spring of my revelation, the manifestation of God. And then it says, through him I have caused all created creation to testify there is another God except him. Why? Because he who is everlasting, hidden from the eyes of men, can never be known except through his manifestation. This is the concept of the manifestation of God being God in role, God in function, but not in essence. That you will never know me save through that which I manifest out. You will never know the fundamental essence of what Rob is. We even looked and we'll never know the fund fundamental essence of a shovel or a coffee cup. We will only know it through its attributes. This is a concept that we have delved into in previous videos. So therefore, we're only going to encounter reality through some embodiment, some series of properties or attributes. Because the unseen, that essence, can in no wise be revealed, because as soon as it is, it comes through the filter of properties and qualities. Just like when I am attempting to communicate my love. Um, we think of, for example, something like a theory. Again, if we use Charles Darwin's theory, or we use a, a logical syllogism, or some other argument, uh, say from the sciences. You're never going to trip on a theory. You will always encounter a theory in some embodiment. You will always encounter it in a paper book. Or you might encounter, say for example, Darwin's theory within an audio recording, the vibration of sound waves. You could take that theory and carve it on a piece of rock. You could actually paint it with oil paintings. You could represent that theory in multiple different languages and codes, and it would, in essence, be the same thing. And yet, the manifestations you would encounter of it would be radically, radically different. You're also never going to bang your head on a virtue. <laughs> you will encounter love or compassion or generosity through instances of vocalization or acts done in the spirit of love. Uh, gifts given in the spirit of generosity. Once again, you don't encounter either ideas, truths, arguments, theories, virtues, or values, except through the embodiment of some action, some tactile reality that is, if you will, the conduit, the manifestation, the medium through which you encounter that virtue, that knowledge, or that sacred. The manifestations of God can never be known through, save through their manifestations, just like you can never know the reality of anything save through its properties, just like you can never know an argument save through the audio or video that's being fed through a YouTube channel. You're always going to encounter it in some medium, in some form. There's no thoughts, if you will, or expressions of love without sound waves of voice, or pen, or carved in stone. This is how we encounter all things. It is also how we encounter the sacred. And, since there can be no tie of direct intercourse to by the one true God with his creation, and no resemblance whatever can exist between the transient and the eternal, the contingent and the absolute, he hath ordained that in every age and dispensation a pure and stainless soul be made manifest in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. Unto this subtle, this mysterious and ethereal being, he hath assigned a twofold nature, the physical pertaining to the world of matter, and the spiritual which is born of the substance of God himself. Something that can perfectly reflect the revelation of God unto humankind. It's interesting here, it says, shall be made manifest in the kingdoms, plural, of earth and heaven. And this is something that I go into far more deeply in our afterlife series. Um, and then it says, he assigns them a twofold nature, 
pertaining to the world of matter and the spiritual born of the substance of God himself. That this is actually that primal will, that lahut, the concept of the word, the first mind. That is the, the revelation of the divine unto creation. I do want to add one note here, and there's a, this, this aspect of incarnation. Because it says they cannot incarnate himself unto man. We're going to read another quote from Gleanings. That the manifestations of divine justice, the day springs of heavenly grace, have, when they appeared amongst men, always been destitute of all earthly dominion and shorn of the means of worldly ascendancy, should be attributed to this same principle of separation and distinction which animateth the divine purpose. Were the eternal essence to manifest all that is latent within him, were he to shine in the plentitude of his glory, none would be found to question his power or repudiate his truth. Nay, all created things would be so dazzled and thunderstruck by the evidences of his light as to be reduced to utter nothingness. How, then, can the godly be differentiated under such circumstances from the froward? This is a theme that will come up in future videos on bridging beliefs. On the one sense, the essence cannot incarnate because we encounter things through properties and attributes. At the same time, here in Gleanings, Baha'u'llah is saying that there is another reason why the full revelation of God cannot be manifested unto humankind, and he calls it the principle of separation and distinction. That how in the end could anyone deny the truth of a manifestation of God, of a sacredness, of an expression of the sacred, if it was made unequivocally obvious that it was from God. In some sense, if one could see, imagine, the directly, immediately hear a theory and automatically know that it's true, there would be no value in the discerning of the truth of that theory, any more than if every single human being was born being able to play the cello, we would not esteem playing the cello. You see, value and beauty itself is actually tied inextricably into the fact that one must strive and seek it in order to acquire it. We do not think that everyone, uh, that anyone is profoundly and shockingly uh, admirable because they have a finger, because the vast majority of people we know have fingers. That this is something that is a fundamental expression of the human body, therefore it's really nothing. We don't praise 45 year olds, for example, because they can talk or because they can write, unless they've moved through a passage where that has actually been deprived of them and they've rebuilt it through rehabilitation and striving. Then we praise, for example, the articulation of a person. So here, this facet of the inability for the divine to manifest itself, on the one hand, is because that's functionally not possible. The other aspect is, is that God does not give everything to us. The path of virtue and value and knowledge is one that must be tread. It is actually a mountain that must be climbed. We're now going to turn to a concept about the manifestations of God themselves. And it is that, at least as it seems according to the writings of the Baha'i Faith, the manifestations of God are pre-existent. The prophets, unlike us, are pre-existent. The soul of Christ existed in the spiritual world before his birth in this world. We cannot imagine what that world is like, so words are inadequate to picture his state of being. Thereupon they will behold the countenance of the Promised One, the adored beauty, descending from heaven and riding upon the clouds. By this is meant that the divine beauty will be made manifest from the heaven of the will of God, and will appear in the form of the human temple. These ancient beings, though delivered from the womb of their mother, have, in reality, descended from the heaven of the will of God. The door of the knowledge of the Ancient of Days being thus closed in the face of all beings, the source of infinite grace, 
hath caused those luminous gems of holiness to appear out of the realm of the Spirit in the noble form of the human temple, and to be made manifest unto all men, that they may impart unto the world the mysteries of the unchangeable being, and tell of the subtleties of his imperishable essence. These beings that we refer to within the Baha'i writings as the manifestations of God seem unequivocally to be beings that, though in appearance they have come from the womb of their mother, in reality they have descended from the heaven of the will of God. They are manifested in the noble form of a human temple to tell the subtleties of his imperishable essence. The Guardian says that they are pre-existent. He gives the example of Christ having existed prior to his manifestation on the world or the plane of history. This also we see actually, and we won't go too much into this in here, but we see this within actually the story of the birth of the Buddha, within the tales we have of Krishna himself. That these beings, though not God in essence, are pre-existent vessels, if you will, pre-existent temples, through whom the sacred communicates its love and guidance unto humankind. Question. What is the meaning of the verse in the Gospel of John? And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Answer. Pre-existence is of two kinds. One is essential pre-existence, which is not preceded by a cause, but which exists in itself. For example, the sun shines in itself and does not depend on the radiance of the other stars for its light. This is called essential light. But the light of the moon is derived from the sun, for the moon is in need of the sun for its radiance. Thus, with respect to light, the sun is the cause and the moon the effect. The former is ancient, antecedent, and prior, while the latter is preceded by something else. The second kind of pre-existence is temporal pre-existence, which has no beginning. The transcendent word of God is sanctified beyond time. The past, the present, and the future are all equal in relation to God. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow do not exist in the sun. There is likewise precedence with regard to honor and distinction. That is, the most distinctive precedes the distinctive. Thus, the reality of Christ, who is the Word of God, undoubtedly precedes all created things in essence, in attributes, and in distinction. Before appearing in human form, the Word of God was in a state of utmost sanctity and glory, abiding in perfect beauty and splendor in the height of its majesty. So in this case, Abdu'l-Bahá actually uses a passage from the Gospel of John, the New Testament, of Christi the Christian New Testament, to express these concepts of pre-existence being essential, temporal, and with regard to honor. Now the Word of God does not depend on some other's light for it. That the Word of God has a temporal pre-existence with no beginning and Note here again, precedes all created things in essence, attributes, and distinction, all three of these. And then says that before appearing in human form, the Word of God was in an utmost state of sanctity. That this is the opening of the Gospel of John as well. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That that being the Word of God, the Logos, in the by terms, the primal will, the first remembrance, is through whom all created things have come into being, is first among distinction in all, and is itself eternal. It is from a deeper understanding of these concepts that we can begin to see what is meant by the voices of the manifestations of God within the Baha'i writings. We're going to start with a quote here from Gleanings. Inasmuch as these birds of the celestial throne are all sent down from the heaven of the will of God, and as they all arise to proclaim his irresistible faith, they, therefore, are regarded as one soul and the same person. So because they're all sent down from the heaven of the will of God, they are regarded as one soul, one person. 
These manifestations of God have each a twofold station. One is the station of pure abstraction and essential unity. In this respect, if thou callest them all by one name and dost ascribe to them the same attributes, thou hast not erred from the truth. So once again, if you consider the, if you will, the Shakespearean sonnet or the recitation of Darwin's Origin of the Species, if I had 15 people in this room who could all perfectly recite or the Origin of the Species or the Tempest, right? Then in some sense, they are, they are all one. Because everything that has come through them has actually been, say, the words of Darwin, or the words of Shakespeare, or the words of Marcus Aurelius. When they are recited in purity and truth, we can actually say, well, this was the same person speaking. It is clear and evident to thee that all the prophets are the temples of the cause of God, who have appeared clothed in diverse attire. If thou wilt observe with discriminating eyes, thou wilt behold them all abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne, uttering the same speech, and proclaiming the same faith. So they come appearing in diverse attire, in different clothing, in different garbs, different heavenly bodies, as we saw from Abdu'l-Baha in London above. But if you use discriminating eyes, if you look carefully, you can see them all first abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, and now they're seated on the same throne uttering the same speech. The other station is the station of distinction, and pertaineth to the world of creation and to the limitations thereof. In this respect, each manifestation of God hath a distinct individuality, a definitely prescribed mission, a predestined revelation, and specially designated limitations. Each one of them is known by a different name, is characterized by a special attribute, fulfills a definite mission, and is entrusted with a particular revelation. At this point we come, if you will, to the rub, <laughs> or the center axle um, of this issue. Each of the manifestations of God, according to Baha'u'llah here, have a distinct personality. So each of the mirrors that reflect that one primal will. Each, if you will, the reciters of that book, though they be reciting that same, same theme, that same sonnet, that same argument, that same theory, are themselves a distinct personality. But it continues, and I really do think that each one of these we could go into very deeply. A distinct personality, a def definitely prescribed mission. So they have a particular goal that they have when they come and are manifested on the plane of history. A predestined revelation and specially designated limitations. They're known by a different name. Then it says they're characterized by a special attribute with a definite mission entrusted with a particular revelation. So the communication, if you will, if you imagine them as delivering the love letters of God to humankind, if you will, letters of counsel to his children, each one of those letters has a different mission, a different particular designation that is attempting to address certain concepts that we find within the human body politic and the individual lives. In a sense, when I look, for example, at, say, the writings of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, we have a series of different letters Right? that are, in many ways, his love letters to the many churches of the Christian community at that time. And it's trying to address different facets of doctrine, of structure, and of actually the personal path between the individual or the community and Jesus Christ. Just like the love letters that I might send to my children over time, the messages I might send to them, they differ in their prescribed mission, their limitations, and... In this case, we see that the deliverers, if you will, the different mirrors that are held up to reflect the light of God, are themselves distinct. And we we'll see here that this is where the words and utterances flowing appear to diverge and differ. This is where we have to be more discriminating. 
It is because of this difference in their station and mission that the words and utterances flowing from these wellsprings of divine knowledge appear to diverge and differ. It hath ever been evident that all these divergencies of utterance are attributable to differences of station. Thus, viewed from the standpoint of their oneness and sublime detachment, the attributes of Godhead, divinity, supreme singleness, and inmost essence have been and are applicable to those essences of being, inasmuch as they all abide on the throne of divine revelation and are established upon the seat of divine concealment. Through their appearance the revelation of God is made manifest, and by their countenance the beauty of God is revealed. Thus it is that the accents of God himself have been heard uttered by these manifestations of the divine being. From the standpoint of their oneness, which would be the standpoint of the primal will of God, the standpoint of the word of God, the first mind, the first remembrance, this is where the attributes of Godhead and divinity have been expressed from. And it's important to understand this, that this is why you have these utterances that sound in certain instances like the messenger of God is claiming the station of divinity, even though, as Baha'u'llah says, that this is in the station of utter self-effacement and non-existence. Viewed in the light of their second station, the station of distinction, differentiation, temporal limitations, characteristics, and standards, they manifest absolute servitude, utter destitution, and complete self-effacement. Even as he saith, I am the servant of God. I am but a man like you. So when we look at their temporal limitations, the fact that the Buddha was a man, and really was a man, that Jesus Christ is a historical figure, a person, that if they say, I am a servant of God, I am a man like you, this really is true. They are actually a physical temple of a human being, and themselves have been charged with manifesting unto the realms of Nasut, the, the created world we live in, the distinct prescribed mission and revelation. They are a communicator, they are an intermediary, they are a servant. Were any of the all-embracing manifestations of God to declare, I am God, he verily speaketh the truth, and no doubt attacheth thereto. For it hath been repeatedly demonstrated that through their revelation, their attributes and names, the revelation of God, his names and his attributes are made manifest in the world. So here, and this is I think important to understand and really take in when we actually begin to say, look at expressions of say Krishna within the Gita, or we're looking at passages from the New Testament, that were any of them to say, I am God, he speaketh the truth. And then yet it's qualified. Why? Why is it that this is them speaking the truth? Because through them is the only way we can actually have an interaction with the direct revelation of the sacred unto humankind. So if I were to tell you, I am Rob, I am truly Rob, the sound waves that pass from me to you are obviously not Rob. And yet to think of that as anything other than Rob speaking to you would be equally mad, <laughs> right? That this is actually really the way that the sacred, the divine court communicates with humankind and always has done so. And were any of them to voice the utterance, I am the messenger of God, he also speaketh the truth the indubitable truth. Are they a messenger from God? Yes. Are they a human being and a servant? Yes, actually it's their servitude that makes them the messenger of the expression of the divine. Do they speak with the voice of God? Yes, they do. They are reciting Shakespeare. They are reciting Darwin on the origin of the species from the domain of the sacred. By virtue of this station, they have claimed for themselves the voice of divinity and the like, whilst by virtue of their station of messengership, they have declared themselves the messengers of God. In every instance, they have voiced an utterance that would conform to the requirements of the occasion, 
and have ascribed all these declarations to themselves, declarations ranging from the realm of divine revelation to the realm of creation, and from the domain of divinity even unto the domain of earthly existence. Thus it is that whatsoever be their utterance, whether it pertain to the realm of divinity, lordship, prophethood, messengership, guardianship, apostleship, or servitude, all is true beyond the shadow of a doubt. Therefore, these sayings which we have quoted in support of our argument must be attentively considered, that the divergent utterances of the manifestations of the unseen and daysprings of holiness may cease to agitate the soul and perplex the mind. So in each of these cases, they're speaking from one facet of their reality. And Baha'u'llah is asking us to be attentive, to really, really consider it, to see that if we start trying to understand the multi-layered or multifaceted reality to a manifestation of God, their necessity as an intermediary, the fact that they are pre-existent and born and sent down in the form of a human temple, and yet at the same time abide within a true human life, that we can see that they can say that they are a servant, a messenger, an apostle, and even the voice of divinity itself. And yet the Baha'i writings are very, very clear to understand that that is only in the fact that they themselves are an empty vessel communicating from the first remembrance, from Lahut. That these are beings descended from the Crimson Ark, descended from Jabarut, that are pre-existent, that are the heavenly bodies we saw in Abdu Baha in London, that are embodying the attributes of God in a prescribed mission and a distinct revelation for humanity to find their beloved. As to the holy manifestations of God, they are the focal points where the signs, tokens, and perfections of that sacred, pre-existent reality appear in all their splendor. They are an eternal grace, a heavenly glory, and on them dependeth the everlasting life of humankind. To illustrate, the Son of Truth dwelleth in a sky to which no soul hath any access, and which no mind can reach, and he is far beyond the comprehension of all creatures. Yet the holy manifestations of God are even as a looking-glass, burnished and without stain, which gathereth streams of light out of that sun, and then scattereth the glory over the rest of creation. In that polished surface the sun with all its majesty standeth clearly revealed. Thus should the mirrored sun proclaim, I am the sun, this is but truth. And should it cry, I am not the sun, this is the truth as well. And although the day star, with all its glory, its beauty, its perfections, be clearly visible in that mirror without stain, still it hath not come down from its lofty station in the realms above. It hath not made its way into the mirror. Rather doth it continue to abide, as it will forever, in the supernal heights of its own holiness. So the lights of the Son of Truth emanate out and reflect in the mirrors of these individual personalities which communicate unto humankind the radiant and gathereth the radiance of the Son to shine that out into the human world. I know I have, I have two children and in communicating to them I have at times taken them up to a mirror and I've said, is that you? And they will say, well, of course that's me. And to say that that image in the mirror is not my son or is not my daughter or not me when I lean over <laughs> would be silly because it, that, that is me if I'm looking in a mirror. And then I would say, at the same time, is it really you? Well, no, I'm over here. My children will have said, I'm over here. So, in, well, I guess in one way it is me, but at the same time it isn't. And I'll say to them, yet to say that that's anyone other than you would be absurd. And they'll say, well, well, it's a reflection of me. Yeah, it is. But that, again, coming back to it, that's what you're seeing now. You're seeing a manifestation of me. That's not really me. 
This is actually the face of Rob. This is the voice of Rob. This is the, the sharing I'm having at this moment. And I actually have a definitely prescribed mission for coming in front of this camera. Um, and I have many different personalities myself, different facets of my character that shine out at different times to different people. And such is the core of the sacred, such as the self of God. We do not encounter the unknowable essence that is anything, even ourselves, let alone God. So in our examination now, we're going to, if you will, focus in now uh, in the realm of Jabberut. So not Hahut, the unknowable ineffable essence, or the primal will, Lahut, but the highest court. God, the most powerful, the most exalted, the most great, addresseth the holy beings created through the primal word that proceeded from his mouth, and beyond them the concourse on high, and beyond them those whom he hath sanctified above the comprehension of all who are on earth and in heaven, and whom he hath raised up through his hidden and inscrutable will, saying, Rejoice in your very souls, for the most auspicious time hath come, and the hour hath struck round which revolve all the other hours foretold in the tablets of God, the Almighty, the All-Glorious, the Most Merciful. And the hidden morn hath broken forth, in this treasured name, from the dayspring of divinity, shedding its radiance upon all that hath been, and all that shall be. Blessed be the Lord of all bounty, the source of this supernal grace. So, in this passage in Days of Remembrance, God addresses the holy beings created through the primal word of God. These are the distinct personalities I will propose. These are the heavenly bodies of the sacred court. The manifestations of God, who themselves are pre-existent, that get sent down with a prescribed mission to communicate and tell of the subtleties of the divine essence. And he is saying to them, Rejoice in your very soul, and to all created things. Each manifestation of God hath a distinct individuality, a definitely prescribed mission, a predestined revelation, and specially designated limitations. Each one of them is known by a different name, is characterized by a special attribute, fulfills a divine mission, and is entrusted with a particular revelation. These distinct personalities, these heavenly bodies, um, in the fact that they are brought down with a prescribed mission, and notice here with specific, sorry, notice here with specially designated limitations, characterized by a special attribute. So as if the sacred court, the primal will is telling us throughout this concept of progressive revelation, different attributes, different qualities of the relationship between God and men, different facets or, if you will, aspects of God himself. In these series of different love letters that are being shared, it is really in the concept of the various scriptures of the world religions that they're being unfolded unto humankind. It's not telling us the same thing. It's expanding that map, that rich tapestry, so we can get a, a better understanding of our beloved, as if our father or our mother from far away continues to send us messages, these letters, so that we get to unravel, if you will, the reality of that divine being. This again has relationship to the fact that we'll see certain qualities or certain facets or certain attributes within one manifestation of God, and then we see them in another, and very oftentimes this can become confusing for people. Um, even within what are often seen as wholly compatible scriptures, if you will, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, and then facets that we find in the Quran or aspects within, say, the Gita or the Upanishads or the Vedas. Um, here we have a quote from Gleanings again, that touches on this theme. It hath, therefore, become manifest and evident that within the tabernacles of these prophets and chosen ones of God, the light of his infinite names and exalted attributes 
have been reflected, even though the light of some of these attributes may or may not be outwardly revealed from these luminous temples to the eyes of men. That a certain attribute of God hath not been outwardly manifested by these essences of detachment doth in no wise imply that they who are the daysprings of God's attributes and the treasures of his holy names did not actually possess it. Therefore, these illumined souls, these beauteous countenances, have, each and every one of them, been endowed with all the attributes of God, such as sovereignty, dominion, and the like, even though to outward seeming they be shorn of all earthly majesty. This quote from Baha'u'llah is addressing this potential source of misunderstanding where we see certain attributes or qualities or expressions from one manifestation of God than another. Uh, there's often, a, uh, if you will, an analogy used by many Baha'is and firesides where we might meet with Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and atheists and Muslims, etc., uh, to share the teachings of Baha'u'llah, where simply because your teacher isn't expressing certain aspects of their knowledge does not mean they don't possess it. Right? And this really is obvious. It's a very simple analogy, but there's much within it. Uh, I actually am partially the teacher of my children. I am, I am a, if you will, part-time homeschooling father where I am sharing what I know, but I actually have to, if you will, compact it, uh, shorten it, or simplify it so that they can get a nugget of it. That doesn't mean that's all I know. I actually at times have to be very careful that I don't babble on for long periods. So I have to trim off what I understand in order to communicate it to them. There's aspects of my character and my personality that they only see parts of, right? Whereas someone else, who, say, who was a peer or a, a, a brother of mine, will get qualities of me that my children don't ever fully see. That doesn't mean I don't have them. And this is what's being brought forward here. And there's there's two aspects of it. One is, is that... Um, we have to make sh if we can understand that if, say, you were to encounter me as a boss, uh, which I am for some individuals, you would see a certain aspect of me that is in many ways um, structured by that prescribed mission of being a supervisor. You will see certain facets of my character where... If you were to meet me, say, for coffee, you will see certain aspects of me come out that were not present in my role, say, of managing others. So this is a very, very common and easily understandable concept. It does, I, myself, for example, had a past where um, I studied the martial arts for many years with a very you know, profoundly skilled teacher. And so I have in me skills, uh, martially, for example, that you're not seeing right now. It doesn't mean I don't have them, it's just you're not seeing them. I also like playing music. That skill is hidden. It doesn't mean I don't possess it because it's not expressed outside. And what's interesting here is, I think it's very important at the end of this passage, it says, therefore these illuminated souls, these beauteous countenances, these, these faces, the masks, if you will, of God, have each and every one of them been endowed with all the attributes of God, and then it says, such as sovereignty, dominion, and the like. Even though at outward seeming, they be shorn of all earthly majesty. I think it's very important that Baha'u'llah chose that one. Because if you look at, for example, the personage of Jesus Christ, and, and you were to be a Christian, and you believe, for example, in the Trinity, that this being is, if you will, the author of creation, obviously, he didn't have to die in the sense of he could have stopped it. God, him itself, is fully capable of subduing, subduing the Roman Empire, right? Or the Byzantine Empire, or any empire. And yet, those qualities of sovereignty and dominion are not manifested. I believe that Baha'u'llah has actually chosen this because it's saying, okay, look, if, if you yourself look at whatever revelation you believe in, in whatever concept of God you, you conceive of, you obviously believe that if there is a divine being, and the divine being was able to create the universe and fashion the laws of the universe, that 
he, he could actually have the sovereignty and dominion to make certain things happen, but the divine being doesn't. That doesn't mean that that divine being, or if you're talking about a manifestation, a divine incarnation uh, on the plane of history, could have controlled people, but did not. It does not mean that that character does not have the sovereignty and dominion of the divine court, but is choosing not to express it. And that is the same throughout progressive revelation. That their knowledge, what you see expressed, is to the level of the student, not to their own capacity. That the amount of dominion and sovereignty they express is according to a prescribed mission, a particular revelation, a special attribute. It's not that they don't possess it. I now want to bring forth a quote that I used within the afterlife deepening. There was a series of actually seven videos on the afterlife in the Baha'i writings on this channel. This quote, which is from Gleanings, states that in every world of God there is a prophet. Here is Baha'u'llah from Gleanings. Through his potency, the trees of divine revelation have yielded their fruits, every one of which hath been sent down in the form of a prophet, bearing a message to God's creatures in each of the worlds whose number God, alone, in his all-encompassing knowledge, can reckon. So as you'll see in the Afterlife series, the worlds of God are infinite in range and countless in number. And the manifestation of God is sent down in the form of a prophet into each of these worlds of God. And we really do see these images within Hinduism, especially within Hinduism and Buddhism, where that being is, if you will, a fractal image, bearing a letter of love to be communicated to that realm. And in many ways, the faces of God, the heavenly bodies, the individual personalities, are a multiplicity. I do not think in any way, when we look to the writings uh, of the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, and we will look at this in the future, that these are the destiny of any human being you know. These are beings which are themselves pre-existent for all eternity. These are, if you will, the many facets of the face of God. We have a passage here which really, really elucidates this. And this is again from Gleanings. The conceptions of the devoutest of mystics, the attainments of the most accomplished amongst men, the highest praise which human tongue or pen can render, are all the product of man's finite mind and are conditioned by its limitations. Ten thousand prophets, each a Moses, are thunderstruck upon the Sinai of their search at his forbidding voice. Thou shalt never behold me. Whilst a myriad messengers, each as great as Jesus, stand dismayed upon their heavenly thrones by the interdiction, Mine essence thou shalt never apprehend. From time immemorial he hath been veiled in the ineffable sanctity of his exalted self, and will everlastingly continue to be wrapped in the impenetrable mystery of his unknowable essence. Every attempt to attain to an understanding of his inaccessible reality hath ended in complete bewilderment, and every effort to approach his exalted self and envisage his essence hath resulted in hopelessness and failure. I think it's in passages such as this that we start to get a really clear picture of what the Baha'i writings are communicating. There is a Sinai of their search, Mount Sinai. And upon the Sinai, the mountain of their search, 10,000 prophets, each of Moses, are thunderstruck at his forbidding voice, Thou shalt never behold me. And it says, a myriad messengers, each as great as Jesus, stand dismayed upon their heavenly thrones by the interdiction, in essence, thou will never apprehend. 
and every attempt to attain a full understanding of his inaccessible reality ends in complete bewilderment. And this is again where a great deal of misunderstanding can suddenly come about, because we just read a passage by Abdu'l-Baha previously that Jesus was the Word of God in, in the Gospel of John, and that that being was eternal, right? And was the, the express first remembrance, the one, the first remembrance, the will of God, the Word of God. But here we have this, this picture, if you will, of, the, of a mountain of search, where all these different messengers, these different manifestations of God, are trying to find the Beloved. And from their own station, which is incomprehensible to us, are seeking to know more. We bear witness that the loftiest of the divine names are but servants at thy door, and that their most glorious manifestations bow down before thy countenance and are humbled in thy presence. Exalted, immeasurably exalted, art thou above the mention of every soul and the understanding of every heart. Exalted, immeasurably exalted, art thou above the description of any one save thyself and beyond every conception of thy creatures. Were thine own manifestations to soar upon the wings of the seen and the unseen, yet would they fail to attain unto the first effulgence shining from the heaven of thy most exalted countenance and the dawning place of thy most sublime revelation. And were the exponents of thy lordship enabled to ascend for as long as the kingdoms of earth and heaven endure, yet would they be forever powerless to draw nigh unto the day-star of thy beauty." So these heavenly beings, the heavenly bodies, the individual mirrors, which descend into all the worlds of God, that tell of the subtleties of the Divine Friend, stand upon a mountain, awestruck, that ye shall never know me. That were they to soar on the wings of the seen and unseen, for all time, it says, and it's, it's just important to note it here, they would attain, fail to attain under their first effulgence, shining from the horizon of thy most exalted countenance. They would be powerless to draw nigh into the day star of thy beauty. And I propose that that once again is the first remembrance, the first will, the Logos that was reflected within the person of the Buddha, the person of Jesus Christ, within the person of the Bob and the person of Baha'u'llah. Now there really is a sense, and we're going to see this if we, God willing, we can proceed to study Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and Christianity from this perspective, that we can begin to, if you will, clear out some of the confusion surrounding this. Because these, these beings, themselves, fashioned by the will, would soar forever up the mountain, the Sinai of search, to understand the day star, the sun, the one who is manifested in each of them, in all the worlds of God. They are the temple that is sent down, communicating that radiance. Wherefore, I bear witness with my soul, my spirit, my entire being, that should they who are the daysprings of thy most holy unity and the manifestations of thy transcendent oneness be able to soar so long as thine own sovereignty endureth and thine all-compelling authority can last, they will fail in the end to attain unto even the precincts of the court wherein thou didst reveal the effulgence of but one of thy most mighty names. Glorified, glorified be, therefore, thy wondrous majesty. Glorified, glorified be thine unattainable loftiness. Glorified, glorified be the preeminence of thy kingship and the sublimity of thine authority and power. There is Haud, the ineffable, and all discussions about God are a discussion of Lahut, that one eternal sun, that singular point, the primal will, 
the word, the singular manifestation. That singular manifestation communicates unto the world of creation through these heavenly bodies, through these intermediaries, even though it itself is an intermediary from the essence to creation. That one intermediary. And it's that one intermediary that in the station of absolute self-effacement spoke unto the people of God in the temple of Adam, of Noah, of Jesus, of the Bab, of Baha'u'llah, of Buddha, of the Prophet Muhammad. Yet these, if you will, individual distinct personalities themselves, right, are seeking that day star they wish to know. And there's a theme that we see within the Baha'i writings that is very, very common, that one's own conception of something, right, one's own perspective of it, is something, if you will, wrapped up within us. It is a product of our own understanding. We see this in one of the videos on this channel about are we divine, the Atman Brahman conception. Please take a look at that, it might help. In this concept, Abdu'l-Bahá states that were we to truly be able to understand the very nature of God, then we would actually have to be on the same level. For me to truly understand the ultimate brilliance, say, of an Einstein, I have to be someone who can understand and be his equal. I think to truly, and again, I don't think this is a radically difficult to understand concept, but that would mean that the manifestations of God, though they are infinitely above us, stand awestruck on the Sinai of their search. And they can ascend as long as the kingdoms of earth and heaven endure, and yet never fully, ultimately draw nigh into the day star, Lahut, the first remembrance, the first will. Because if they could, then they would actually be that being. They would actually be equal unto it. But they are the distinct personalities, the different heavenly bodies, the qualities and attributes of the primal will. That will of God itself, the station often what is termed as the station of the sun, both S-U-N and S-O-N, is that divine, radiant day star of the revelation of God, through whom no revelation is ever communicated, through whom was fashioned reality, and upon which we're all dependent, itself cannot be Hahut. Or else it would be Hahut. Sorry, it can't know Hahut, else it would be Hahut. So the revelation of the unknowable essence, which is mediated to us, is a love letter all the way from the top to the bottom. Unless I be misunderstood, and we will examine this further in the future, these beings are in no way like us. There are stations and capacities to which the human soul have started on this lonely little planet at this time in history, can ascend to, and they are glorious and wondrous. The station where we can truly begin to understand what it means to achieve nirvana what it means to achieve moksha, or the fana, the final extinction in Islam, that these are the aspirations of the human soul, and the aspirations under which we can achieve are unfathomably exalted, in infinitely beautiful. And yet these beings themselves are pre-existent and eternal, and abide in a sanctity at the apex of Jabirut. If you will, they themselves are the individual letter bearers, the individual tablet bearers under humankind. And when one of them takes the place, and this is again something I hope we can go into, when one of them takes the place as being the mouthpiece, the tongue of grandeur at the tree beyond which there is no passing, which is a symbol of the manifestation of God. This concept of the tree beyond which there is no passing, which we find within the Baha'i writings, the Sadra Tumantaha, that when they take, if you will, that prescribed revelation, they stand in as God himself, as the tongue of grandeur 
the speaking book, to which all others, in my understanding and my beliefs, are utterly and completely subservient, because it's that mirror that is reflecting at that moment in time. And I believe, as we begin to get deeper into this perspective of the 10,000 Moseses, in their own search, trying to seek out a new tale of the subtlety of the Divine Essence, which is communicated from that oneness, that primal will, that singular manifestation of God, then all of a sudden this map begins to flower out and become so exquisite and complex that we begin to be able to see the nature of Brahman, of Saguna Brahma and Nirguna Brahma. We begin to see what it is, how the relationship is between the Father and the Son, between the Dharma and the different bodies of the Buddha. We get to, if you will, take this concept of cosmology and begin to hear the accents of our beloved in every single scripture of the world's great and varied traditions. That when we begin to more deeply understand cosmology, understand the voices of the manifestation of God, we finally get to have, if you will, a perspective to see all of this grand tapestry, this amazing series of love letters from God to humankind, and we can finally show that the unity that the Baha'i Faith is actually pr pronouncing to be the mission of Baha'u'llah, to the bringing and gathering in of all these different communities into a one sacred tapestry, is not something that we're proposing as, 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 as just an aspiration of some wonderful idea, but rather is something that can be pulled out from the Baha'i writings. That when we can actually see with the eyes of Baha'u'llah, of Abdu'l Baha, of the Bab and Shoghi Effendi, and we try to really understand what they're saying, suddenly the different passages from Buddhist and Hindu and Islamic scriptures of the, the Jewish Tanakh and of the New Testament suddenly come into focus. And we can begin to see, I would suggest, even ancient, ancient symbols and myths from the very traditions of humankind begin to have echoes of beauty and truth and wonder that a Baha'i, grounded deeply in the writings, can begin to see as truly the final ingathering of humankind under the great tabernacle. Simply through this picture, through more deeply understanding what it is that the Baha'u'llah and the Bab have said unto humankind in this day. Thank you very much.